So before we get into the different parts of the brain, let's talk about the types of things that actually protect the brain. So if we start from the outside and work our way in, obviously we have hair that provides some padding and protection. And then you have your skin and underlying tissues like adipose. Then we have our skull, which in some ways does too good of a job protecting the brain because once the bones of the skull fuse together, if you get some sort of swelling within the brain tissue or too much cerebral spinal fluid being produced that causes those spaces to, to swell, there's nowhere for it to go. So you end up getting that compression back in by the skull so you can kind of be forcing the brain to be compressed against the skull, which is very damaging. And then from there we have our meninges. So we have the dura mater, which literally means tough mother. And this is a really tough outer layer that actually adheres to the inside of the skull. There are two layers of dura mater, and between those two layers we have blood. So we have blood between the layers. From there we have the arachnoid layer, which kind of like its name implies, I think arachnophobia is a fear of spiders, so this is a sort of delicate spider webby sort of layer. And then the deepest layer is the pia mater, which means delicate mother. And this folds into all of the indentations and goes over the ridges of the cerebrum or the outer part of the brain. Between these two layers here, we're going to have cerebrospinal fluid and we're going to have blood vessels. So you'll notice that because the blood vessels are out here, they're superficial relative to the pia mater, the blood does not have direct access to most of the brain. So what are the things that are actually protecting the brain? Well, as we mentioned, the meninges. So you have your dura mater, the arachnoid, and the pia mater. We're going to continue those meninges all the way down around the spinal cord. So this is one vertebra. This is a spinous process right here sticking out. So you can feel those in the back of your spine. And then this is my spinal cord with spinal nerves that are branching off of it. This outermost layer would be the dura mater. This middle layer would be the arachnoid. And the deepest layer would be the pia mater. And cerebral spinal fluid is going to be between those two layers. So if I need a sample of cerebral spinal fluid to check for an infection or something else going on, maybe meningitis, then I need to get between these two layers to get that sample of cerebral spinal fluid. Now there's all this, also something called the blood-brain barrier. Now what that means is that blood does not have direct contact with most of the brain tissue which means nutrients have to diffuse through that pia mater to get to the brain tissue. In addition to not having direct access to most of the brain tissue, the capillaries, the very small vessels that are on the surface of the brain right above the pia mater, are less porous than other capillaries in the body. So in other words, if I were to draw kind of the walls of a capillary out in my other tissues, and we've got blood in here. You'll notice there's lots of little kind of spaces and holes within those capillary walls that allow lots of exchange. But the vessels that we see on the surface of the brain, 
are more like soaker hoses that you might get for your garden. They look kind of thick and fuzzy and water just sort of slowly seeps out through the walls of these vessels. So because they're less porous, less stuff can diffuse out compared to these other capillaries in the body. So this is a selective barrier, kind of like the plasma membrane of your cell. There are a couple of places in the brain that do have direct access to blood, like the hypothalamus, which has a lovely little place that is very overactive in me, apparently, and that's called the vomiting center. So as you can imagine, if it perceives there's something toxic or harmful within the blood, then it's going to make you vomit. Stress actually increases the permeability. So that means more stuff can get across this membrane. We already mentioned these are not very permeable capillaries. And the blood-brain barrier is incomplete when we're looking at newborns or premature infants. So that means more things can get across that barrier and into the brain tissue that are potentially harmful. Now, cerebral spinal fluid flows through spaces within the brain called ventricles. Up underneath each of the sides of the cerebrum, or the two halves of the cerebrum here, are going to be these large lateral ventricles. Then fluid is then going to flow to my third ventricle, which is right here. So it flows down into that space. And then it's going to flow down into my fourth ventricle here through a little structure called the cerebral aqueduct. Cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF, is very similar in composition to blood plasma. So we're going to have mostly water, but we're also going to have ions and proteins and uh, glucose, other nutrients, things flowing through this cerebral spinal fluid. You should know where cerebral spinal fluid is produced. So it's produced within the ventricles of the brain, and it's made by capillary beds called the choroid plexus. So this is a capillary bed within the ventricles. That fluid is going to again flow from the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle to the cerebral aqueduct and then into the fourth ventricle. So lateral ventricle, third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct, fourth ventricle, and then it travels down and around the entire brain and spinal cord. And it's going to help to kind of um, provide buoyancy for the brain and spinal cord. It's going to suspend and support those structures, give them a little protection from any kind of impact, as well as bringing nutrients to the brain. So as I mentioned, cerebrospinal fluid is made by the choroid plexuses that are found in the ventricles. It's formed from plasma, helps to protect and also bring nutrients to the brain and spinal cord, and help to maintain stable ion concentrations. It goes through the ventricles, through that central canal of the spinal cord, which is a little hole right in the middle of the spinal cord, and flows through the subarachnoid space. So that's that space between the arachnoid layer and the pia mater. And then cerebral spinal fluid is going to be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream by structures called arachnoid granulations, which are found on the surface of the brain. So if we go back here for just a minute, we're going to have this cerebrospinal fluid flowing through the subarachnoid space here between the arachnoid and the pia mater, and it gets reabsorbed in these arachnoid granulations up on the surface of the brain. 
So again, we start up in the lateral ventricles, which are kind of up underneath this structure. We're going to flow into the third ventricle, through the aqueduct, into the fourth ventricle, down and around the entire spinal cord and around the brain. And we get reabsorbed by these little arachnoid granulations. If I produce too much fluid by my choroid plexus, then you could get something called hydrocephaly. And I'll show you what that looks like. So this image shows you what the ventricles look like when they are normal sized, and then these would be enlarged ventricles. So that's your hydrocephaly. If it happens before the skull bones fuse, then you can get an enlargement of the entire skull. And there are a few pictures up here. So the head becomes quite enlarged. I've done some research on it in the past, and actually it can be um, a disorder that can be livable even if it's found later on in life, if it's found early enough, and then they just have to keep draining that fluid. So that covers different protections in the brain, and we'll stop there for now.